You're not the kind of guy who would be at a place like this at this time of morning. So begins Bright Light's Big City, the first novel of Jay McInerney and the one that would become the foundation of what would later be referred to as the literary Brat Pack. Along with Brett Easton Ellis, David Levitt, and Tama Janowitz, the foursome was complete. Vanity Fair would call them the young and the wasted. Newsweek referred to them as the divine decadence. They would be hailed as much as criticized for their partying, their outrageous interviews, and their attitudes, as much as for their literary accomplishments. But before any of this would come to be, Jay McInerney would first have to get lost and then write that initial novel. Welcome to House of Words, a podcast about writers, New York, and minimalism. I'm your host, Jason Nemoa Hardin, and today we're taking a deep dive into Jay McInerney's Big Lights, Big City. Published by the Vintage Books imprint of Random House on August 12, 1984, the backside reads, Living in Manhattan as if he owned it, a young man tries to outstrip mortality and the recurring approach of dawn with nothing but goodwill, controlled substances, and wit to sustain him in this anti-quest. He can run, but he can't hide. His relentless flight through nightclubs, fashion shows, editorial offices, and loft parties finally brings him to the reckoning point, where he is forced to acknowledge loss and, possibly, to rediscover his better instincts. Quote, The most interesting things that happen in my books are usually the things that arise spontaneously, the things that surprise me. End quote. Not much is known about Jay McInerney's childhood, and he has been good at keeping it so through four decades of interviews. What we do know is that he was born John Barrett McInerney Jr. on January 15, 1955 in Hartford, Connecticut to mother Marilyn Jean and corporate executive father John Barrett McInerney Sr., he has not disclosed whether or not he has any siblings, making it safe to assume that he was an only child, as the topic would surely have come up in the close to 40 years as a famous writer. He attended Williams College, a private arts college in Williamstown, Massachusetts, graduating from there in 1976. Next, he attended Syracuse University in New York, where he graduated with a degree in English. His later years, however, are more clear. In 1977, finding himself somewhat at loose ends, Jay took a trip to Japan as a part of a Princeton in Asia fellowship, taking Japanese courses at the Institution for International Studies outside Tokyo, as well as teaching English at Kyoto University. His stay there not only provided him with material for his second novel, it also allowed him to find a great interest in martial arts, and most importantly, he found love meeting and marrying half-Japanese model Linda Rossiter. In 1979, the young couple moved to New York City to pursue their respective careers, Jay as a writer and Linda as a model. In order to support himself, he got a job as a fact-checker for The New Yorker. Unfortunately, he would be fired a mere seven months into the job and went to work as a freelance reader for Random House. The next two years would take a turn for the darker, however. By 1981, his first wife had left him, and he began writing less and partying more. Things seemed to be not leading anywhere he wanted to be. In 1982, Jay was staying in the East Village of Manhattan with his classmate and future editor, Gary Fiskishon. They met at Williams College and became friends. Well, by this time in 82... Gary was now working as a reader of unsolicited scripts for Random House. He would then go on to be the editor for Raymond Carver and Brett Easton Ellis, among others. Brett Easton Ellis was covered in our 13th episode for those who may have missed that one. Jay, on the other hand, had had a bad previous year. Within the space of the last few years, in addition to having been fired from his job at the New Yorker and his first wife leaving him, his mother died of cancer. He then decided to retreat to Syracuse to get away from it all. 
While there, he studied fiction writing along with Raymond Carver and Tobias Wolfe. When he returned to Manhattan, though, he picked up exactly where he left off. Though maybe with an even more self-destructive inclination than earlier, he explored and more often than not indulged in the downtown nightlife that Manhattan had to offer. He was mesmerized by the music and the art scene and would catch the Ramones playing at CBGB's and Iggy Pop at the Peppermint Lounge as often as he could. He would eavesdrop on Lou Reed and Andy Warhol at the Mud Club and dive as deep into what underground New York had to offer in the early 1980s. His life wasn't going in any particular direction, which was exactly why he was so eagerly throwing himself back into the patterns of his old life using up the night in dives and clubs, often nearly crawling back to his apartment as the sun rose, shining on yet another threatening morning. On one of these visits to a nightclub, he found himself in the bathroom, gazing at himself in the mirror. The friend he had been at the club with was long gone. The girl he had been pursuing most of the night had ditched him, and worst of all, perhaps, he was flat out of cash. It was still dark in the club, but... He knew that the sun was waiting for him outside. Staring at himself in the mirror, he said, You're not the kind of guy who would be at a place like this at this time of the morning. But here you are. He was under the influence of cocaine and alcohol at the time and therefore felt as if he was observing himself from a distance. That's your interior monologue, he told himself. When he finally left the club and managed to conquer the 15 blocks through dawn's increasing light and finally got back to his loft apartment, all he wanted to do was collapse onto the bed and sleep. But before he did, he grabbed a piece of paper and wrote those lines of dialogue he had said to himself through the bathroom mirror at the nightclub. Then he fell into a deep, hard sleep. Some months later, Jay was back in Syracuse when he got a call from George Plimpton, the editor of the Paris Review. Though he had recently sent a story to them, he was flabbergasted to hear back from them and from the editor himself, nevertheless. Plimpton told him that he really liked the story he had sent, but wanted to know if he had anything else before he decided whether or not to publish it. Jay told him that he would look through his writings and get back to him. As soon as he hung up the phone, he searched through all the writings he had done in the past year. All of it, according to Jay, was derivative and stale. That was, until he got to the piece of paper he'd brought with him from the loft in Manhattan after that particularly heavy night out on the town. It was barely a few sentences, all of them written in the second-person singular form, but... It struck him like a bolt of lightning. That same night he sat down and began to flesh out the story. It became a short story told in the same second-person narrative and held the same impact which he had jotted down the initial sentences with. The story was informed by the pain and misery that came from the previous year he had experienced. But still, somehow, he managed to walk a tightrope that allowed him to keep a wry, though comedic, touch to the downward spiral of the protagonist. The fact that the protagonist is falling apart emotionally, but is telling it from outside himself, as if watching himself do so, gave the story more objectivity and made it easier to digest. The short story was given the title, It's 6 a.m., Do You Know Where You Are?, and was promptly both accepted and published by the Paris Review. Now, not long after the story was published, did he realize that the story didn't end there. He wanted to explore and tell more of the backstory of the wasted nightclub patron who was the protagonist and who looked at himself with such an objective eye. Quote, The only sensible approach is not to take it too seriously. What counts is the writing. End quote. The continuation of the book seemed to spill out of him, and in the course of six short weeks, he had an additional 11 chapters to go with the short story. And by his own admission, he was partying hard and making more than his share of Bolivian marching powder disappear up his nostrils during the creation of the piece. While writing and rewriting the novel, shaping it into the final product it would wind up being, 
he was often listening to Joy Division, The Cure, and Talking Heads. Though he was skeptical about being able to sustain the second-person narrative over the course of the entire novel, it still seemed like the most natural way to write the story. Over the course of writing the novel, however, he did try rewriting parts in the first and third person narrative, but each time he did so, something seemed to leave the essence of the story. The energy, the self-consciousness, and the humor seemed to drain from it, so he reverted back to his initial impulse and kept it like he had initially planned it. And when it comes to his later writing habits, he doesn't seem to have many strict habits, but he does make a point of trying to write every day. This is the advice he got from Raymond Carver, and one he does his best to stick to. Though not a morning person, he does his best writing in the morning and has allowed himself to adjust to it. When he wakes up, he starts the day with copious amounts of coffee and then sits down to write around 9.30. If he hasn't managed to write anything by noon, he feels like the day has slipped away from him and finds it very difficult to get anything going writing-wise. He usually sits down to write from 9.30 until he gets really hungry, which typically takes about three to four hours. Sometimes, similar to many, if not most writers, he sits down by the desk some days and faces the terror that is the blank page. But he remains there, hoping that something will spark his inspiration. It might be a sentence, a voice, a memory. If it doesn't happen that day, he tries again the following day. It's all about that perseverance and the unwillingness to throw in the towel. His mantra, though not perfect science, is basically that you need to be sitting by your desk, writing, or trying to write virtually every day. By sitting there, he finds it easier for his muse to find him. In his words, it's about showing up every day and being ready for the inspiration that might strike. Prior to writing Bright Lights Big City, he struggled with the so-called curse of writer's block. He had hoped that the curse was broken with the writing of the novel. Unfortunately, it would return more than a decade later in the late 90s. Still living in Greenwich Village, he loves New York City and feels that the city is his muse. So when he isn't writing or is between novels, he takes a lot of walks around the city, trying to listen to conversations and just generally take in the ambience, trying to find inspiration. Opposite of his literary friend and fellow Brat Pack member, Brett Easton Ellis, Jay isn't a writer who knows where the story is headed. He doesn't make outlines in order to follow and seldom knows more than a chapter or two ahead of where the story is headed. When he's in the middle of a novel, it gets easier as he's often aware of where the writing is headed by that point and what he is going to do for the three or four hours while sitting in front of his desk that morning. The lack of an outline, however, can make the process, especially when starting out on a novel, much more difficult. But what keeps him going is the feeling that impacts when he reaches that middle of a novel and realizes, to some extent, where he is going with the story. That's when he finds it the most fun. The book ended up quite autobiographical. McInerney was fired from the job just as the protagonist in the story had been. He had also been briefly married to a fashion model, but luckily his love life would improve greatly when he met a fresh-faced graduate student named Mary Raymond. He would ultimately dedicate the book to her along with his mother and father. Now, his writing process had much to do with taking things from his own life and either exaggerating them, keeping them as they had occurred, or changing them up nearly completely which is something that allowed him to create a character that was himself, but also more reckless and feckless than himself. It gave him a certain freedom, and it also allowed him to report on several subcultures, including the downtown art and club scene, which hadn't been covered in media, let alone fiction up to that point. It seemed like the extension of gonzo journalism that was needed to counteract the capitalistic Reagan-era America of the 80s and early 90s. The novel would later be regarded as delivering the news of the zeitgeist, though he didn't have anything like that in mind when he started writing it. As he would later say, I don't think anyone sets out to be the voice of a generation or to define a decade. Certainly I didn't. 
He was without a doubt influenced by the writers that he admired and wished to pay homage to novelists such as Watt, Solinger, Joyce, and Hemingway in his writing. In the first pages of the novel, there is even a quote from Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises. If you wish to learn more about Ernest Hemingway, take a listen to episode 33. A fun fact about Bright Lights Big City is that the novel got its title from the 1961 Jimmy Reed Blues song of the same name. Jay hoped that he'd managed to create something new, despite not understanding why there had been such a big impact. Around this same time, he said, it was as if I suddenly invented cocaine. The novel was a huge success, both critically and to popular acclaim. His use of the second-person narrative in a successful fashion, the present tense, the humor, and the acute social commentary the novel held were noted and admired by most critics. Over the next two years, the Brat Pack was formed and began making an impression on pop culture. The Brat Pack would appear in gossip columns, posing for fashion layouts, and even endorsed products. When the novel went on to become the source material for the 1988 film by the same name, which was also written by McInerney and starred Michael J. Fox, he was at the peak of his success and celebrity. Though unsatisfied with how the movie turned out, he is, however, glad that people see the novel as a novel and that it hasn't disappeared behind the movie it produced, a fate which several other novels have suffered. Then in 1999, the book went on to become an off-Broadway stage musical. The success of Bright Light's Big City would not be duplicated with his second novel, Ransom, published in 1985, though it has garnered some success later on. His life would become no less turbulent with the success and celebrity status of the Brat Pack and Bright Light's Big City. Down the line, there would be more ex-wives in both panned and celebrated books. One thing everyone should be able to take away from Jay McInerney, if there is any higher learning in the development of his story, is the value of following your gut instinct. Even when it seems like madness to do something that deviates from the norm, and you expect yourself to fail completely, if your gut tells you that you are headed in the right direction, you must be doing something right. He could have shied away from the much less popular second-person narrative and gone for a safer option, but he didn't. And that made all the difference. Let me leave you with a quote from the first member of the Brat Pack and now the voice of the zeitgeist that would follow. I was fortunate to get a lot of mileage out of my vices. The point is not to be debilitated by your pleasures, Maybe I have lucky genes or something, but I've never been truly addicted to anything except pleasure in general. <laughs> End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason Nemoa Hardin. We here at House of Words ask that you please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash houseofwords or paypal.me slash houseofwordspodcast. Alternatively, you can subscribe and encourage others to subscribe to our YouTube page, House of Words Podcast. Every little bit helps more than you might think. Until next time. Turning those pages. House of Words is written and produced by Crystal M. Sanchez. Narrated and written by me, Jason and Moorharden. And music by Creature Nine and Wood. All rights and ownership belong to Crystal M. Sanchez and Jason and Moorharden.